Well, welcome everybody. I'm glad you all have joined us to hear about uh, the Salem witch trials. Um, aside from the landing of the Mayflower and the first Thanksgiving, uh, no other event in the history of 17th century colonial America has captured the public's imagination more vividly uh, than this episode. Um, uh, the trials have been the subject of two major films, uh, The Crucible, uh, starring Daniel Day-Lewis and Paul Schofield, based on a play by Arthur Miller, uh, as well as a film called uh, Three Sovereigns for Sarah, which starred uh, Vanessa Redgrave and was on PBS, and dozens and dozens of books. Um, some depictions have been quite accurate, others less so. Uh, over the years, historians have advanced various theories about what caused the hysteria and how best to interpret the trials from a modern perspective. So we're gonna delve into a little bit of that as we go forward. If you have ancestors who lived in Suffolk, Middlesex, and especially Essex counties in Massachusetts in the 17th century, you may have wondered whether you descend from one of these unfortunate men and women uh, who were accused of witchcraft, or conversely, one of those who made accusations against neighbors or one of the judges presiding at the trials. Uh, chances are good that even if you are not a direct descendant, you may have some family connection with some of them, a sibling or a cousin of an ancestor who was in some way connected to the event, or even someone who signed a petition on behalf of someone accused. That's my instance. I don't have a, a witch ancestor myself, but I am uh, related distantly to one of the accusers as well as to someone who defended the accused. So uh, there's a lot of connections there. So what I would like to do today is provide some overview of the events that made up what is known as the Salem witchcraft hysteria, uh, discuss some of the theories that have been proposed to explain it, uh, look at some of the people accused, uh, uh, and finally show some examples of some of the genealogical sources that are available for researching people involved in this event. Um, accusations of witchcraft occurred all over the world in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. Uh, in Germany, thousands of accused witches were burned at the stake. Hundreds more were executed in Scotland during the same period. In England, perhaps 200 were also executed. A special focus has been the county of Essex in England, where many of New England's Puritans originated. Between 1645 and 1647, that is during the Cromwellian period, uh, during the English Civil War, uh, Matthew Hopkins, a self-appointed investigator with the title Witch Finder General, accused many people of, of practicing witchcraft um, and sent as many as 300 women to their deaths. Uh, he later wrote a book called The Discovery of Witches, which uh, had a profound influence on the Puritan government of Massachusetts. Hopkins had pre prescribed certain tests for determining the guilt of a suspected witch, including tying them to chairs and throwing them into ponds to see if they sank or floated. A sinking body meant that the subject was innocent. Uh, if it floated, she was guilty. Uh, also examining bodies for so-called witches marks, which were often hidden and could be revealed by pricking pins. These persecutions helped put the witchcraft hysteria in New England in some kind of perspective. In light of what happened in England, its, manifest, its manifestation in New England is not at all surprising. Indeed, perhaps uh, part of the, the phenomenon can be attributed to the mindset of the Puritans who took a, little, a literal interpretation of a passage in Exodus 22, verse 18, quote, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, unquote. They believed that the devil was not an abstract being, but an actual incarnate creature that lurked in the woods of New England. With a variety of invisible supernatural powers, he was able to interact directly with witches, causing them to make contact by signing his book, and who then were able to make themselves appear to others through apparitions. Any misfortune or mishap that occurred in a town or befell a member of the community carried a divine message requiring at the very least inner repentance. Some mishaps, however, were considered the direct, the direct work of Satan. So the possibility of witchcraft had always lurked under the surface of Puritan society, even before Hopkins' book made the search of witches more popular. Before the Salem village outbreak, 11 women and one man had been executed for witchcraft in Massachusetts and Connecticut. They included Alice Youngs of Hartford in 1647, Margaret Jones of Charlestown and Mary Johnson of Hartford, both in 1648, Alice Lee Lake at Dorchester and Elizabeth Kendall of Cambridge in 1650, 
Mary Parsons of Springfield and Marjorie Bassett of Fairfield, Connecticut in 1651, Mary Knapp of Hartford in 1653, uh, Anne Hibbins of Boston in 1656, Mary Sanford, Mary Barnes, Nathaniel Greensmith and his wife Rebecca, all of Hartford in 1662, and Anne Glover in Boston in 1688. Many more unfortunates had been accused during these years but not convicted. Each of the executions had been isolated events and not part of large scale hysteria. Uh, it should be noted that in many instances, the courts tried to determine this, the truth of the accusations in good conscience using all of the methods prescribed by English common law at that time. Uh, and note that all of these executions were by hanging. No one in, in America was ever burned at the stake. Uh, and you will sometimes see pictures of of women being burned at the stake with colonial people standing around, and that's that's an inaccurate depiction. Uh, still, there were certain characteristics that define many of those accused of witchcraft that help us put Salem Village uh, into context. Uh, historian Richard Godbeer observes that both men and women could be targets, though four-fifths of those tried for witchcraft in New England were women. Uh, quote, especially vulnerable, he says, were women who had passed menopause and thus no longer served the purpose of procreation. Women who were widowed and so neither fulfilled the role of wife or had a husband to protect them from malicious accusations and women who had inherited or stood to inherit property in violation of expectations that wealth would be transmitted from man to man. Women who seemed unduly aggressive and contentious or who failed to display deference towards men in positions of authority were also more likely to be accused, end quote. Many of the accused lived in close uh, proximity to one another. Uh, another historian, John Demos, has pointed out the close connections that existed between people in a small New England town, a much different level of contact than what we experience in modern society, even within our own neighborhoods. He writes, quote, the bricklayer who rebuilds your chimney is also the constable who brings you a summons to court. An occupant of the next bench in the meeting house, the owner of a share adjacent to one of yours in the upland meadow, a rival for water rights to the stream that flows behind the meadow, a fellow member of the local uh, band or militia, uh, an occasional companion at the local ordinary or tavern, a creditor from services performed for you at the previous summer, but as yet unpaid for, a potential customer for wool from the sheep that you have begun to raise, the father of a child who is currently a bond servant in your house, a colleague on a town committee to improve the public roadways and so on. Do the two of you enjoy your shared experiences? Not necessarily. Do you know each other well? Most certainly, end quote. There was often a history of conflict in some neighborhoods, including Salem Village in 1692. Because of these close community contacts, there was plenty of opportunity for perceived slights for misunderstood actions and unexplained phenomena. During the witchcraft hysteria, some believed that the alleged witch had sought revenge by causing some misfortune to occur to the accuser. The Salem village hysteria occurred against this backdrop, this sort of community structure that was very intimate. Uh, it is important first to clarify where we are looking. The hysteria broke out at Salem village, which is now the town of Danvers and not the city of Salem. Uh, Salem Village had, had separated from the city of Salem in 1672 and became its own town, though the trials uh, and a few of the accusations and some of the inquiries were made in the larger Salem town. Also, there were outbreaks of hysteria nearby at Ipswich and Andover, as well as at Boston and Charlestown during the same time as the Salem Village outbreak, and all were considered to be part of the same hysteria. 1692 was a time of uncertainty for the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The original Royal Charter had been revoked in 1684 when Sir Edmund Andros had been installed by the Catholic King James II as governor of New England. Unpopular from the beginning, Andros had been forced to leave in 1689 when King James was deposed in the so-called Glorious Revolution that made the Protestant William and Mary the new reigning monarchs. England had approved a new colonial charter in 1691, and in the spring of 1692, a new governor, William Phipps, arrived in the colony. Phipps created a new county judiciary 
to deal with the growing caseload of court matters. And he also established a special court of Oyer and Terminer to handle the problem. Additional anxiety existed throughout New England in the early 1690s unrelated to the charter. Increasing numbers of Anglicans and Quakers had begun to arrive in Northern New England and their presence threatened Puritans, many of whom believed that Anglicans were pagans and idolaters and Quakers were so depraved as to be possessed by Satan. Indian attacks were also on the rise after the, in the aftermath of King Philip's War of 1675-76, in which 1.5% of the white population lost their lives. Many Puritans believed that the Indians worshiped Satan and were tangible instruments of his bidding. Richard Godbeer points out that Andover, Massachusetts, where there were actually more accusations of witchcraft in 1692 than at Salem Village, suffered a number of deaths in this new round of warfare, the only non-frontier community to have people killed when the new hostilities broke out. So uh, then there was the nature of Puritanism itself that not only helped foster a belief in witchcraft, but also encouraged quarrels among neighbors. Salem Village was full of personal conflict in 1692. Neighbors disputed property lines and the grazing rights of livestock. The church at Salem Village had undergone years of internal strife. Two earlier ministers, the Reverend James Bailey and the Reverend George Burroughs, later who was not formally ordained, but was later tried and convicted for witchcraft, had both left the church under a cloud when the congregation had refused to pay them. Burroughs' successor, the Reverend Deodat Lawson, had also left abruptly, would, but would return to play a role in the hysteria, testifying that he felt his family had been afflicted by infernal powers since several members of his family had died. Lawson's successor, the Reverend Samuel Paris, is widely regarded to have been a key player in the witchcraft hysteria. Uh, he arrived in Salem Village with only a, about half of the congregation supporting him. He had, adopt, he had helped to foment opposition because he had kept the congregation waiting for more than a year before he accepted the position. And when he finally did arrive in 1689, he was forced to receive a salary of only 66 pounds in the use of the parsonage, but he was refused the right to use the firewood usually set aside for the pastor. Paris's own personality had made him ill-suited for settling conflicts. And instead of being a peacemaker, he set out on a mission to root out what he called iniquitous behavior among members of his church and to make them do public penance for small infractions. It did not increase his popularity. Uh, as strange as such actions may seem in a modern context, such rules were not unusual in a Puritan church. Within the context of Salem Village, however, they added to the tensions already brewing. Um, to understand how a Puritan church worked, it is necessary to have some background on the culture of Puritanism. Uh, in 1630, when John Winthrop came to Massachusetts Bay aboard the ship Arabella, uh, becoming its first governor, he laid out in his famous uh, City on a Hill sermon that he expected members of their new society to support and uphold one another in community, or as he put it, to, quote, abridge ourselves of our super superfluities for the supply of others' necessities, unquote. This knitting together of the community led to the creation of a society where everyone watched their neighbors closely and stood ready to point out errors in their behavior whenever they noticed them. The result was that instead of strengthening the bonds of, of, of the community with love and harmony, in some places such intrusions often led to bitter disputes and festering resentments. Self-examination and public confession were also expected and in fact became central to their religious ethos. Puritans believed that the church was the centerpiece of life in any village and the glue that held the community together. Uh, preaching was the center of a Puritan service with sermons lasting between two and three hours. Uh, clergy and government officials forbade uh, music and dancing except for the singing of uh, unaccompanied hymns in church. Uh, harvest festivals were allowed, but Christmas and Easter holidays were strictly forbidden and considered pagan. Everyone in the village was expected to attend church for three hours every Saturday and, or excuse me, every Sunday and Wednesday. If someone absented themselves from services, they were often visited by church officials to find out why they did not attend. The outbreak of the hysteria at Salem Village began in early 1692 when Samuel Paris's daughter, Betty Paris, age seven, and his niece, Abigail Williams, age 11, began experiencing fits of an unexplained and unusual nature. They screamed, fell on the floor, uttered strange noises, contorted themselves into odd positions, and described being pinched 
or pricked with pins. Two other girls in the neighborhood soon joined them, Anne Putnam, age 12, and Elizabeth Hubbard, age 17. Some of the girls are said to have learned voodoo and divination in the kitchen of the Paris Parsonage from Tituba, an Indian slave owned by the Paris family. Tituba had tried to tell their fortunes by using the whites of eggs and mirrors in a kind of crystal ball. This form of white magic in itself was not unusual. Many settlers in New England, in addition to being Puritans, brought with them a belief in folk magic, the ability to see, heal the sick, tell fortunes, and offer protections against witchcraft. Those who practiced these customs were known as, quote, cunning folk. And while they and their superstitions were frowned upon by the authorities, they were not considered inherently evil. In fact, magic could be used for both good and evil, and these initial interactions with Tichuba may have been nothing more than an expression of these folk practices. As public attention of the girls' unusual behavior increased, so did the frequency of their fits. They began accusing members of their community as their tormentors. Their first targets were social outcasts, Sarah Solart Good, Sarah Warren Osborne, and Tichuba herself. Sarah Good, the wife of William Good, a weaver, was an odd woman known for begging. Sometimes she would utter words under her breath if someone refused her alms. In addition to being a tormentor, she was accused of sickening local livestock. The goods were considered social out outcasts because they were under the support of the town. Sarah's father, John Solart of Wenham, had committed suicide by drowning in 1672, which added to the stigma surrounding the family. Sarah would be among those executed by hanging. Sarah Warren Osborne, the widow of Robert Osborne, had been absent from church for more than three years due to a protracted illness, a fact that stigmatized her before the congregation. Um, she was involved in legal disputes with the Putnam family, which made her an enemy of Ann Putnam, the chief accuser among the afflicted girls. She died in jail in May 1692 and was never formally indicted or tried. Tichaba, the slave woman, is a mysterious figure who was likely a Caribbean Indian rather than an African. Um, at her trial, she freely admitted to being a witch and stated that witchcraft was being widely practiced in the village. Because of her confession, she was not executed, but instead encouraged the behavior of the girls to name others in the community as witches. More accusations followed in March, 1692. The new group included Sarah Good's four-year-old daughter, Dorothy, who under interrogation implicated her mother at trial. Imprisoned for months, Dorothy was later released, but was reportedly never the same afterwards. Also accused was Martha Rich Corey and Rebecca Town Nurse, both of Salem Village, and Rachel Hatfield Clinton of nearby Ipswich. Uh, Mrs. Corey, um, the wife of Giles Corey, shown in this 19th century image, had spoken out loudly against the witchcraft accusation, accusations and was considered a social outcast because she had given birth to an out of wedlock uh, out of wedlock to a mulatto child named Benoni before her marriage to Corey many years earlier. She was, however, a fully con covenanted member of the Salem Church. Uh, Rebecca Town Nurse, widow of Francis Nurse, was an even more important member of the Salem Village community, a woman of good character and also a fully covenanted church member. The nurses had been, been among those who opposed Samuel Paris's appointment to the church, however, and they were involved in a protracted property dispute with the Putnams. Some historians believe that Ann Putnam, her chief accuser, had been coerced into making her accusations against nurse by Ann's father, Thomas Putnam, because of this land dispute. Rachel Hatfield Clinton of Ipswich was a divorced woman who had earlier been accused of adultery and imprisoned. She was thus a social outcast, as Sarah Good had been. In April came more accusations and indictments as the, hysteria, as the hysteria picked up steam. The new defendants included Sarah Town Cloyce, Rebecca Nurse's sister, and Elizabeth Bassett Proctor, the wife of John Proctor. When Proctor protested his wife's arrest, he too was arrested. More accusations and arrests followed within the week, including Giles Corey, Martha's husband, a covenanted member of the church, but one who had been accused of theft in the past. Also accused was Abigail Hobbs, Bridget Playfer Bitch Bishop, and Mary Warren, the latter a servant in the Proctor household. Bishop's case was most interesting. She was accused of wearing red bodices and of keeping a tavern where people could play shuffleboard. She had previously married Thomas Oliver, a prominent businessman, and later Edward Bishop, a well-to-do owner of a sawmill. Uh, in addition to being accused of tormenting the girls, she was found to have puppets or dolls in her home, which were forbidden in Puritan culture 
and considered voodoo dolls. Uh, Bishop was also known to be, a very, to be very vocal and opinionated, which increased the public dislike of her. Abigail Hobbs, a girl of about 15, was accused with her father and stepmother, William and Deliverance Hobbs. Abigail and Deliverance both confessed to being witches under interrogation, which ironically saved them. They in turn and accused Sarah Averill Wilds of Ipswich, apparently because her son Ephraim had been the constable that arrested them. As the month wore on, there were more accusations and arrests. I won't list all of them, but they included uh, Mary Town Esty of Salem Village and other of the town sisters, uh, or of a Brecon nurse and uh, Sarah Cloyce. Um, uh, Edward Bishop Jr. and his wife, uh, Sarah of Salem Village, uh, who were Bridget Bishop's stepchildren. The Reverend George Burroughs, the former minister of Salem Village. Uh, Mary English of Salem, Dorcas Galley Hoare of Beverly, and Susanna North Martin, the widow of George Martin of Amesbury. Susanna had been accused of witchcraft previously as far back as 1661, so she had a checkered past in the eyes of the community, but she was also a successful farm owner. Uh, but her sharp tongue had apparently irritated her neighbors. In, uh, in May, 26 more indictments were issued, and I won't read all the names, but included on the list were Martha Allen Carrier, the wife of Thomas Carrier of Andover, her sister Mary and Mary's husband, Roger Toothaker of Salem. Also accused were George Jacobs of Salem Village and many, many members of his family, uh, John Willard of Salem Village, a constable who had a, refused to arrest persons that he believed were innocent, Alice Parker, the wife of John Parker of Salem, who had once publicly scolded, scolded her husband for drinking too much. Mary Iyer Parker of Andover, who may have been senile. Uh, Anne Greenslit Pudiator of Salem, an impoverished widow. Wilmot Red, a widow of a fisherman named Samuel Red of Marblehead, also impoverished. Elizabeth Jackson Howe, uh, a wife of James Howe of Ipswich, and Samuel Wardwell, an Andover farmer and carpenter. As many more accusations followed throughout the summer of 1692, they were often tied to personal disputes. One of the most prominent of the accused was Abigail Dane Faulkner, daughter of Andover's minister, the Reverend Francis Dane. As such, she was not a social outcast, but was considered a, a wealthy and socially upstanding woman whose husband, Francis Faulkner, had become ill. The court had previously granted her administration uh, of his estate and thus she had control uh, of more property than many of the men of Andover, making her a, a target of jealousy. Her father was also publicly doubted, had also publicly doubted the testimony of the girls accusing the others of witchcraft. In order to respond to the initial accusations from the previous March, the court of Oyer and Terminer convened in Salem town, this is the Salem city, not the village, <coughs> excuse me, in, in June of 1692. Serving as chief magistrate was William Stoughton, the new Lieutenant Governor, while William, well, Thomas Newton was the Crown Attorney and Chief Prosecutor. Contrary, contrary to popular belief, Thomas Danforth, uh, who was portrayed by uh, uh, Schofield in the movie The Crucible and as a major character, did not, prescribe, did not preside at the trials, and he actually doubted the use of the evidence and tried to end the trial. So that's a, a, a part of The Crucible that is inaccurate. First to be tried was Bridget Bishop, whom a grand jury had indicted and then tried and convicted all on the same day. She was the first to be hanged on June 10th, 1692. Indictments were also handed out for Rebecca Nurse and John Willard. Both would soon be found guilty and sentenced to die. Uh, Nurse would be hanged on July 19th, along with Sarah Good, Susanna Martin, Sarah Wilds, and Elizabeth Howe. Three new justice had, justices had taken over the court by the end of June, including John Hathorne, the ancestor of the writer Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, Jonathan Corwin, and Bartholomew Gedney. The judges followed the customs of English common law in carrying out the trials. An accuser entered a complaint or formal accusation against another person, the alleged witch, with the magistrate or local justice of the peace. If the accuser was deemed to be credible, uh, then the magistrate would issue a warrant for the arrest of the accused. The accuser would usually post a bond in indicating that he intended to follow through on the complaint. When the warrant was served, uh, the accused would physically be bound by a constable and brought before the justices for examination and interrogation. The constable would write on the warrant whether the return was successful or unsuccessful, that is, whether the accused was apprehended. During this time of examination, the accused witch was uh, urged to confess whether or not she did so, 
If the magistrates were satisfied that enough information had been gathered, the accused was then handed over to the appropriate court, either uh, in a quarterly court or the court of lawyer and terminer for trial. In this painting, we see an accused witch being examined for physical evidence of being in league with the devil. Such an examination would not have been made in a courtroom, but would have been made in private. At this point, the justice would, would call additional witnesses to corroborate the accusations brought by the original complainant. They recorded the testimony and depositions, which were sometimes added to over a period of time, given the fact that the ink in many of these documents differs. Uh, these testimonies or depositions provide us with a very clear picture of both why the accus accusations were being made and what types of people were being accused of witchcraft. While the girls making the initial accusations were often convulsing on the floor and complaining of being tormented by their specters, other um, witnesses offered evidence of past wrongs, unexplained illnesses or deaths of livestock that they attributed to witchcraft. I wanna read a little bit of the testimony of, uh, of the examination of Rebecca Nurse, which is dated uh, the 24th of March, 1692, including the words of Justice Hathorne, Abigail Williams, Ann Putnam and Rebecca Nurse. So Hathorne says to, to Putnam, this is the judge, what do you say, have, have you seen this woman hurt you? And Putnam says, yes, she's beating me this morning. Hathorne says, Abigail, have you been hurt by this woman? And Abigail says, yes. Then Ann Putnam in a grievous fit cried out that she hurt her. Hathorne then says, goody nurse, here are two. Ann Putnam, the child, and Abigail Williams complains of you hurting them. What do you say to it? And nurse says, I can say before my eternal father, I am innocent and God will clear my innocency. Goodman Kenny then complained uh, that when nurse came into the house, we were seized with an amazed condition. Hathorne then says, here are not only these, but here is the wife of Mr. Thomas Putnam who accuseth you by credible information that both of tempting her to inquiry and of greatly hurting her. And nurse says, I am innocent and clear and have not been able to get out of doors these eight or nine days. Hathorne says, Mr. Putnam, give in what have you set to say? And Edward Putnam then gives his testimony and Hathorne says, is this true, goody nurse? And nurse says, I have never afflicted no child never in my life. And Hathorne says, you see these accuse you, is it true? And nurse says, no. And Hathorne says, are you an innocent person relating to this witchcraft? And here Thomas Putnam's wife cries out, did you not bring the black man with you? Did you not bid me to tempt God and die? How oft you ate and drunk your own damnation. And Hathorne says, what do you say to them? And nurse says, oh Lord, help me. And she spread out her hands and the afflicted were grievously vexed. Hathorne says, here are two grown persons now accuse you. What say you? Do you not see these afflicted persons and hear them accuse you? And nurse says, the Lord knows I have not hurt them. I am an innocent person. Hathorne says, it is very awful to see, to see these agonies and you, an old professor, thus charged with contracting with the devil by the effects of it, and yet to see you stand with dry eyes when so many, when there are so many. And nurse says, you do not know my heart. Hathorne says, you would do well if you were guilty to confess and give glory to God. And nurse says, I am as clear as an unborn child. Hathorne says, what certainty there may be in apparitions I know not, yet this with me strikes hard upon you that you are at this very present charge with familiar spirits. This is your bodily person they speak to. They say now that these familiar spirits come to you, come to your bodily person. Now, what do you say to it? And nurse says, I have none, sir. So it gives you an idea of the flow of how this was and how, how, how prejudiced the, the judge is uh, in, in, in these proceedings and not even a, a, at all a, 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 an objective uh, witness or a person trying to reach the, 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 the truth in the matter. So uh, you get an idea of what was going on here. The most controversial aspect of these trials was the use of what was termed spectral evidence. A witness could claim to have seen the apparition of an accused witch afflicting them. The court wrestled with the theological implications of such an accusation with the argument turning on whether the accused witch had to give the devil permission to use their shape for an apparition, thus making them complicit in his actions. But opponents argued that the devil could assume any shape with or without the subject's permission. For most of 1692, the period of the trials, the judges accepted the premise that a subject had to give permission, 
which meant that the afflicted girls could accuse anyone of tormenting them and the accused had no way of defending themselves. There were thus other types of, there were other types of evidence as well, some admissible in court and some not. A popular folk method involved making what was called a witch cake. Some rye meal was mixed with the urine of an afflicted girl and then fed to a dog. As the dog bit into the cake, the witch afflicting her would cry out in pain in the belief that her effluvia, the venomous particles by which she bewitched the girl would remain in the urine. Mary Walcott, the aunt of one of the afflicted girls made such a cake at the start of the hysteria in February, 1692, but she was discovered by Samuel Paris and forced to make a confession before the congregation for using white magic, even though her intentions were good. The courts in Andover did accept the use of so-called touch test in September, 1692. The accused witches were blindfolded and their hands were placed on a girl having a spasmodic fit. If the fit stopped, it meant that the accused was guilty of afflicting her. They believed the, the venom emanating from the witch into the victim would return to the witch when touched. They also examined the bodies of witches for moles or birthmarks, which were insensitive to the touch. And they searched the premises of accused witches for puppets or books made about palmistry and horoscopes. After the executions in July, 1619, there were two more major execution dates. On August 19th, five were hanged, including Martha Carrier, John Willard, George Burroughs, the former Salem minister, uh, George Jacobs, and John Proctor. On September 22nd, the last of the executions occurred with the hanging of Mary Esty, Martha Corey, and Pudiator, Samuel Wardwell, Mary Parker, Alice Parker, Wilmot Red, and Margaret Scott. Two others were convicted, Elizabeth Proctor and Abigail Faulkner, but were temporarily reprieved because both were pregnant. Both ended up surviving the hysteria. Five more women were convicted and condemned, but their sentences were never carried out. They included Anne Foster, who died in prison, her daughter, Mary Lacey, Abigail Hobbs, Dorcas Hoare, and Mary Bradbury. Perhaps the most unusual of death was that of Giles Corey, aged 80, the husband of Martha Corey, who refused to enter a plea when accused of witchcraft, knowing that by refusing, the court would not be able to, to seize his estate. Uh, the, force forced him to endure, the, the judges forced him to endure a punishment called pain fort a dur, which, uh, whereby he was placed under a board with stones piled on his chest. They continued to piling on the stones until he was crushed to death. But uh, his property all went to his, his heirs and none of it was seized by the, by the state. By the late fall, the hysteria had begun to die down for a variety of reasons. A number of prominent people had uh, come to the colony, had been accused, and even more importantly, several officials had begun to doubt the methods for, used for trying witches, specifically uh, the reliance on uh, spectral evidence. Increased Mather, one of the, um, or Mather, I should say, one of the most prominent ministers openly accused the girls and, and openly criticized the trials and wrote, it was be, it would be better that 10 suspected wishes, witches should escape than one innocent person should be condemned. He wrote this in direct contradiction of his son, Cotton Mather, who had earlier written a pamphlet, Wonders of the Invisible World, which had defended the trials. It was clearly the case of a more respected father reprimanding his son. The last witchcraft trial was held in May, 1693, but there were no more convictions and all those imprisoned or awaiting trial were pardoned. Within a very short time, society experienced a complete change of heart over the whole affair. In 1696, the general court designated January 14, 1697 as a public fast day for the quote, tragedy raised among us by Satan and his instruments, end quote. The Reverend Samuel Willard of South Church in Boston, a strong proponent of the trials in 1692, read aloud an apology for the shame of those events. More pamphlets appeared in print that criticized the trials. In 1706, Ann Putnam made a public apology for her role in the affairs. She wrote, quote, I desire to be humbled before God for that sad and humbling providence that befell my father's family the year or two uh, the year about 92, that I, then being a child in my childhood, should, by such a providence of God, be made the instrument for accusing of several persons for a grievous crime, whereby their lives were taken away, who I now have just grounds and good reason to believe they were innocent persons, and that it was a great delusion of Satan that deceived me in that sad time. I can truly and uprightly say before God and man, I did not, out of any anger, malice, or ill will to any person, 
for I had no such thing against any one of them. But what I did was ignorantly being deluded by Satan, end quote. Uh, between 1700 and 1709, the, the families of the victims submitted a number of petitions to the court demanding that the earlier convictions be reversed, that the, and that the excommunications from the churches be reversed, and that the compensation um, be, being given to the families for the losses. In 1711, the general court finally passed a bill that reversed all the convictions, and later that year, Governor Joseph Dudley authorized monetary compensation for the families. So what are the theories about what happened? Um, what can we do to explain this hysteria? And they range from medical causes to social and cultural issues. One of the most popular and controversial theories is what is called ergot poisoning. Scientists argue that a certain type of fungus under the scientific name of Claviceps purpurea grew on the rye at Salem because of an unusually wet year. When the rye was made into bread, it acted as a hallucinogen like LSD and caused the girls to go into fits. Similar outbreaks of ergot poisoning in Europe in the 16th century also resulted in, in witch trials. Other medical arguments have also been advanced, including epilepsy, uh, bird-borne encephalitis, lethargica, and sleep paralysis. The problem with these theories is that, is that if true, it would likely have afflicted more people than just the accusing girls. Some have reduced uh, the problem to what they term the psychopathology of adolescence that teenage girls who made accusations were delusional for a variety of reasons connected with social pressures and perhaps mental disorders not related to ergot poisoning. The problems of bullying that we see in teenagers today was also at work in the past and influenced their aggressive behavior. Uh, some argue that the repressiveness of Puritan culture also played a role and fed the behavior. The girls had an eager audience of supportive adults which gave them a voice that they would not have had otherwise in their community. Um, historians Paul Boyer and Stephen Nissenbaum in their 1974 book, Salem Possessed the Social Origins of Witchcraft, attribute the causes to community factionalism, a view that enjoys widespread support among historians today. Uh, in the book, they conduct a variety of a very thorough probe into the history of property disputes with the Putnam family and others in the Salem Village community. These disputes are more likely a major aspect of the cause. Uh, the three town sisters, Rebecca Nurse, Mary Esty, and Sarah Cloyce had, long, had a long history of disputes with the Putnams. As I have said, the 1690s were also a time when the prevailing culture had difficulty dealing with an increasing number of social outcasts. There were as yet no workhouses or institutions to send the mentally ill or indigent. Uh, so there was no formal system of social welfare. Witchcraft accusations, says Richard Godbeer, resulted as a response to unwelcome requests of neighbors in need. It also came about from the convergence of three components of Puritan culture, the inability to explain or control illness and other misfortunes that befell a community, a deeply held the belief in the presence of supernatural forces and the very personal nature of interactions among people in small communities. As genealogists, how do we approach the witchcraft hysteria? How do we find if our ancestors were involved? Um, there is at present no comprehensive source that traces the genealogies of all of the accused witches or the families of their accusers. Some works have attempted to, to sketch out family relationships, however, and there is an excellent uh, source that, that was published relatively, relatively recently that contains accurate transcripts of all the witchcraft trial material. Uh, this 2009 book called The Records of the Salem Witch Hunt and was edited, uh, was edited by a team led by, by Bernard Rosenthal and published by Cambridge University Press. It is probably the most complete scholarly work available on the sources of the trials. It has been well reviewed and uh, hailed with much acclaim by a variety of reviewers. The book looks something like this in the there's an appendix in the back that lists everyone listed in any way connected with the event. Not only uh, the accused witches and the accusers are included, but also people in the community who sign petitions on their behalf um, in their defense. Rosenthal lists the maiden names of women when known and the parents of each person, if known, along with dates of birth and death. Uh, this is a genealogical gold mine. Uh, and if you have ancestors in Essex and Middlesex counties, in the 1690s, there is a good chance you will find some connection here. Uh, this is probably the, 
the first or one of the first sources you should consult. The book also includes very detailed transcriptions of all the surviving court proceedings relating to the witchcraft hysteria. Uh, you can read the texts of the accusations, a transcript of the uh, interrogations of the accused, and in doing so, see in detail how the court system worked. Again, uh, this is a tremendous resource giving us the best published record of the events. A good bibliography on the witchcraft trials uh, comprises the rest of the book. All these elements combine to make this uh, the most essential tool for doing historical research on the trials. It does not contain a lot of genealogical information outside the biographies of the participants. Another book you might want to think about looking at is, is one by Enders Robinson called Salem Witchcraft in the House of Seven Gables, published in, 69, it's published in 1992 at the 300th anniversary. While not uh, extensively documented, um, Robinson does explore many of the immediate genealogies of the families involved in the hysteria and shows many of the extended families where accusations of witchcraft occurred. Many of the witnesses in these small communities would have known about these kinship networks. So here is a sample page of some of them. Uh, you can see the one on the left shows the relationship of Elizabeth Bassett, wife of John Proctor, her sister Mary Bassett, and her sister-in-law Sarah Hood Bassett, who were also accused. On the right, we see the extended family of Elizabeth Jackson Howe and, and some of the other Jackson family members who were accused. Robinson's work would have been stronger if it had been cited, if citations had been cited uh, and documented, but it remains an excellent work and is useful for genealogical study. Marilyn Roach's 2002 book, The Salem Witchcraft Trials, or excuse me, The Salem Witch Trials, a day-by-day -day chronicle of siege is, as the title comply, implies, a daily chronicle of events from January 1692 to January 7, 1697 as they relate to the hysteria and its aftermath. There is some familial information embedded in the text, and it is otherwise a very readable history. Uh, another readable account of less genealogical value is Mary Beth Norton's book, In the Devil's Snare, which is published in 2002. Uh, a series of appendices uh, contain lists of the accused, as well as the judges, accusers, and confessors of witchcraft. And there is an extensive bibliography. And incidentally, all these books are listed on your handout, so you don't need to write them all down. You, we have them, and I give the call numbers to of the books here at the library. The famous book on this subject is by Paul Boyer and Stephen Nissenbaum called Salem Possessed, which I mentioned earlier, which goes into great historical detail on the Putnam family and the neighboring Porter families in Salem Village as part of their larger geographical and social, as part of a larger geographical and social analysis. Uh, it is now considered a classic study of the phenomenon and many of their conclusions are widely accepted uh, by other historians. Uh, the book contains a map, which is also on your handout, uh, shows, shows the locations of all the accused uh, on a carefully platted map. Um, uh, these are of genealogical as well as historical value to anyone wishing to understand the feuds that existed in the village. The, ar the authors argue that these conflicts help precipitate the hysteria. So the Ds represent defenders and the As represent accusers. So you can get an idea of how they're all laid out here. Uh, in the absence of a single genealogical account, however, researchers are going to have to trace their families back to Essex and Suffolk County, Massachusetts um, in the 17th century using traditional research methods. Look for published genealogies as one possible tool, uh, as well as other uh, direct and indirect sources. On the bibliography, I list a number of works that include uh, genealogical information about the accused witches. There are a number of, of people accused and convicted of witchcraft, and, and 20 were actually executed, six men and 14 women. Of this group, five left no known descendants. They include Martha Rich Corey, who was the third wife of Giles Corey, Sarah Solart Good, Alice Parker, Wilmot Red, and John Willard. But the, the one, those that have descendants, the remaining 15, uh, uh, all have descendants and have people living today who can connect to them. Uh, they include Rebecca Town Nurse, and her sister, Mary Town Esty, uh, Reverend George Burroughs, George Jacobs, Giles Corey, John Proctor, Elizabeth Ayer Proctor, uh, Samuel Wardwell, Samuel, uh, Susanna North Martin, Martha Allen Carrier, Sarah Averill Wilds, Bridget Playfer Bishop, Margaret Stevenson Scott, Elizabeth Jackson Howe, and Anne Greenslit Pudiator. Uh, many more persons, as I have shown, were accused and convicted of witchcraft, but were not executed. So I didn't have time to list all of them. 
One place to begin genealogical study is with a list of sources provided by Gary Boyd Roberts in his book, Notable Kin, uh, which is available online at American Ancestors, uh, also uh, as a, an article in, um, in its journal. Uh, this original two volume work contains a collection of articles that Roberts wrote uh, in the newsletter of the Society. Uh, and the which article appeared in the summer of 1992, listing many of the best print sources available to that time. Uh, Roberts enjoys tracing genealogies of famous people, including presidents, and finding their kinship with persons of historical importance. In this article, for example, he shows the lineage of the Reverend George Burroughs down to Walt Disney. Uh, so there are people like that who have connections to, to famous uh, people hanged for witchcraft. Um, another useful book is Martin Hollick's book, New Englanders in the 1600s, a guide to genealogical research published between 1985 and 2010. Uh, use, it, use the second edition, not the first edition. Uh, Hollick lists hundreds of families by name of immigrant ancestor and, and some of the families of both the accused and the accusers are listed. Some of the references pertain to very rare books and manuscripts available in Boston, uh, but unfortunately not, not at the Allen County Public Library, though we have most of what he lists. You should uh, look at the periodical uh, source index. This is an old reference from when it was on Heritage Quest. That's now uh, available on Find My Past. But there are articles in here that you'll find uh, listings for um, articles on that appear in various journals uh, on various witches, like this one on Giles Corey. Um, you should also look at the Charles Anders Charles Robert Charles Anderson's books, The Great Migration Begins, and his series, The Great Migration, both multi-volume works which have references to several witches who appear as children uh, in those accounts. Of the published genealogies now in print, uh, one of the best ones is a volume on the town family, which includes the sisters Rebecca Nurse, Mary Esty, and Sarah Cloyce. Uh, it is Lois Payne Hoover's book, Town Family, William Town and Joanna Blessing of Salem, Massachusetts, published in 2010, uh, which traces the town descendants through five generations. Uh, it should be regarded as a definitive source for the towns. If you're interested in Bridget Bishop, George Jacob, Susanna Martin, and to some extent George Burroughs, uh, you should consult articles published in the American Genealogist uh, as the best available ones. All are listed in your handout. Helen Carrier's book, Thomas Carrier and his wife Martha Allen, an expanding outline of their many descendants, second, second edition 1996, is probably the best, best available source on Martha Carrier. The book is irregularly numbered and not well documented, however. Uh, two more scholarly books, though short, include the small carrier chapter in Philomene Jenkins' book, Waters, Law, and uh, Allied Families, pages 48 to 50, though it shows only Martha's children. The Allen family is discussed at some length in Mary Lovering Coleman's book, The Ancestry of Charles Stinson Pillsbury and John Sargent Pillsbury, published in 1938 and considered a classic book. Uh, on New England families. Uh, Martha Ayer Parker, wife of Nathan Parker, is more elusive. Her Ayer ancestry is treated in Holman's Pillsbury book uh, also, but her children and descendants are not listed. Uh, the New England Historic Genealogical Society has an unpublished manuscript by W.L. Holman called Andover Ancestry, Volume 2. According to Roberts, this is the work, the most, uh, most authoritative work on her descendants, but you have to go to Boston to view it because it has not yet been published. Sarah Averill Wilds is treated in two sources. Her ancestors and immediate family are listed in Clara Avery's Averill Averill Avery family published in 1914. And for her descendants, you should consult uh, Walter Goodman Davis's book, Massachusetts and Maine Families and the Ancestry of Walter Goodman Davis, volume three. Davis is considered one of the giants in genealogical writing, as is Holman, and his work is well documented. Mary, Margaret Stevenson Scott and her husband Benjamin Scott are traced in Mary Lovering Holman's book, Scott Genealogy, published in 1919. While uh, her Stevenson parentage is not known, her descendants are traced forward for several generations. This volume is not well documented as Holman's later Pillsbury book, but it is still scholarly and, and the best work on the family in print. Elizabeth Jackson Howe's family is referenced in Daniel Waite Howe's book, The Howe Genealogies, published in 1929. Her Jackson ancestry is not traced beyond her parents, William and Deborah Jackson, but her descendants are listed on pages 158 to 277. So the, the book is, is useful, but not documented. 
And Pudiator is probably, probably the least studied of the executed witches. She is mentioned in passing in the Genealogical Dictionary of Maine and New Hampshire, but there is no uh, definitive record of her immediate descendants as yet. Giles Corey's family is treated in an article by Eleanor Spillers in a 1985 issue of the Essex Genealogist. His descendants are all from an earlier marriage and not from his marriage to Martha, Martha uh, the executed witch. Some quarry materials in Purley's History of Salem, Massachusetts are, uh, is, are available there, as is a reference in volume four of Albertus Quarry's book, The Quarries of America, a volume available at the New England Historic Genealogical Society, but one we have not been able to obtain. Uh, the records of the Reverend George Burroughs family have been diffused over a number of sources listed on your bibliography. His royal genealogy is traced in Frederick Lewis's wife's ancestral roots of certain American colonists, while several articles on his immediate parentage and family have appeared in American Ancestor. Um, to date, there is no comprehensive work on his descendants. Uh, two more convicted witches, John Proctor and Samuel Wardwell, uh, have both been featured in very scarce published genealogies that the Genealogy Center has not been able to acquire. Both are available uh, at New the New England Society in Boston. Uh, Wardwell's family and some of his descendants are traced in D.S. Biles' book, Samuel Wardwell of Andover and a line of his descendants. The other is uh, by Proctor, John Proctor of Ipswich and some of his descendants, both very rare manuscript volumes that are there. We do have the Proctor genealogy uh, by A. Carlton Proctor, which is useful. Um, and I, got, I have included a bibliography of a variety of others that are accused of convicted persons not executed. Um, so you'll see Abigail Dane Faulkner, uh, Roger Toothaker, Joanna, Mary and Martha Tyler, Mary Barker, Mary and Sarah Bridges, Sarah Cole, Mary Perkins Bradbury, Sarah Hawks, Ann Dolliver, Dudley Bradstreet, Captain John Alden, Dorcas Galley Hoare, and several others. Robert Anderson's discussion of, of Dorcas Hoare in his galley section of the Great Migration Series brings to light her crime ring, which provides some insight on the general feeling of public uh, against her. Uh, she was really a social outcast and was involved in a petty crime ring at the time. What should we as genealogists take away from the witchcraft hysteria? For one thing, the court records such as they are, are sad and even disturbing to read. They document the miscarriage of justice on a large scale against a group of innocent people. Uh, we cannot help but be sobered by what we read and the cruelty that seems to have been perpetrated in some cases. Yet the, the prosecution for witchcraft is on the wane and the hysteria was one of the last gasps before it disappears from North America and Western Europe. Second, the hysteria offers an extraordinary glimpse into the lives of everyday people in the late 17th century. If you are fortunate enough to be descended either from an accused witch or one of the accusers, you have given, you've been given a chance to look very closely at your ancestor's life in a way that one normally cannot do using other kinds of court records. In the written testimony, we can find the words of the accused and accusers written verbatim. verbatim. We can hear how they spoke and learn how they interacted. And there is a great deal in them to teach us about 17th century Massachusetts, even if we are not directly descended from someone involved in hysteria. It may inspire us to search other court records for ancestors involved in more mundane matters. So in the end, I hope you will come away with a new appreciation for what happened uh, during the witchcraft hysteria in Salem Village and will accept the, the, the challenge of finding some personal to, connection to this intriguing event. So thank you.